flying to space and back under pilot control. But the mission of the A-2 was pure speed. And after a thorough testing program, on November 18, 1966, Pete Knight established an unofficial world absolute speed record of Mach 6.33, or 4,250 miles an hour. On October 3, 1967, Knight set out in the A-2 again with a newly applied ablative coating. His mission was to reach the X-15's maximum speed carrying a dummy scramjet, a new form of power plant for future high-speed, high-altitude flight. 67 seconds after launch, the fuel in the external tanks would be consumed and they would drop away, allowing the X-15 to accelerate out to maximum speed. There is a, a, a sensation of speed. Uh, you know that you're pushing the airplane. It's, I think, akin to, to driving a car. You can drive a car around at 70, 80 miles an hour, and it's, it's rather comfortable. And if you push that same car to, say, 100 miles an hour or 110, you know that you're pushing the, the limits of that, that car. I think the X-15 was in the same category as you begin to go above Mach 6 and you begin to push out farther and farther in the envelope. I think we were well aware of the fact that yeah, things are getting a, a little bit uh, more critical. As we went out to 6.5, 6.7, you were aware of speed. And uh, if you looked outside, as I had a chance to do fleetingly uh, from time to time, uh, you knew that you were moving across the ground and uh, even at 100,000 feet you were very much aware of, uh, of the speed. And even more so aware of the speed in terms of the, of the time of the flight and the amount of, of uh, effort and the amount of uh, uh, experiments that had to be done during uh, that portion of the flight. It was a busy flight. Uh, there was not much time for looking around or joyriding. Pete Knight had reached a speed of Mach 6.7, 4,520 miles an hour, an unofficial absolute speed record for winged aircraft in the atmosphere. But as he brought the X-15A2 in for a landing, he had no idea it had flown for the last time. Everything worked well as far as I could see, but when I got back down on the lake bed, Normally, everybody comes to the front of the airplane, congratulates me on a flight, and uh, helps me get out of the airplane. This time, that didn't happen. Everybody went to the back of the airplane, and I said, there's something wrong. So I got out of the airplane, went around and looked at the back end of the airplane, and the, the scramjet had burnt off. Uh, the lower ventral had sustained considerable damage due to high temperatures. It was like you took a blowtorch into the lower ventral and it melted the material away, got up into the engine bay, cut some of the stainless steel lines so that I was unable to jettison uh, the remaining fuel after I got back. And so it was a heavyweight landing, I, I knew that. And also the flaps didn't work because heat got up into the flap motors. And uh, so there were some of those things that, that we would have had to work out for the next flight. But we knew what the problems were, we knew why it happened, and we felt very confident that we could have corrected those problems and we could have continued on our build-up program out to Mach 8 or VMAX, whatever the, the final Mach number would be. But it was not to happen. The cost of restoring the plane to flying condition was beyond the program's budget. The A-2 retired to the Air Force Museum in Dayton. The last A-2 flight was number 188 in the program. 200 were planned. The other two airplanes continued to fly. On November 15, 1967, test pilot Mike Adams took off for a routine altitude mission in the number three plane. Soon after ignition, things began to go wrong. 
an electrical disturbance interrupted communication and caused damage to the adaptive flight control system. This was no major problem at low altitudes, but just before engine shutdown, the continuing electrical disturbance caused a problem with the flight computer. The instruments began to show faulty information. Adams tried to follow the flight plan and thought he was doing it, but the ground control crew monitoring the flight began to realize the maneuvers the plane was going through were wrong. Problems began to accumulate, and confusion about what was actually happening in the plane caused mounting concern in the control room. Then Adams reported he was in a spin, something unknown in the X-15. He tried everything possible to recover. As Mike uh, re-entered the atmosphere and as the airplane recovered from the spin, the gains in the control system were locked up at 100%, and they did not function from then on. So as he began to get deeper and deeper into the atmosphere and, and the Q, or the density of the air, began to increase, the gains were much too high. The motions of the plane became more and more violent and the X-15 began to experience extreme G-forces. There was nothing the ground crew could do to help Mike Adams solve the situation. Just prior to breakup, uh, it went through about uh, one and a half to two cycles at plus or minus somewhere above 18 Gs in pitch and probably plus or minus eight or nine Gs laterally. And that's what broke up the airplane and the he never had a chance uh, once that started. The X-15 was descending at a rate of 160,000 feet a minute. At 67,000 feet, the fuselage buckled. Because of the high dynamic forces, Major Adams was unable to eject. I think the feeling is that he had vertigo so bad that he never knew what the displays were telling him. And every time he made an input, the display moved in the right direction. But the airplane was not doing what he thought it was doing. X-15 number three broke up in the air. Major Mike Adams was killed. The number one plane was now left to finish the X-15 program alone. On October 24, 1968, Bill Dana made the last flight. It's been called one of the most successful research airplane programs that uh, we ever conducted. And I still believe that, you know, 30 years later, uh, it's still probably the most impressive program that we've done. I think it was uh, one of the most successful research airplanes that uh, the Air Force and NASA ever put together and ever had a cooperative effort in flying. Uh, the data that will come out of that airplane and that program will be used for years and years. I personally would rank very, very high the development of the flight control system to fly exo-atmospheric and then transition back into the atmosphere uh, as one of, the, one of the really great achievements that the X-15 did. If we had continued with the orbital X-15, it would have been the research airplane's natural step right on up the line and we would not be worrying about space stations today they would be up there and a facile way to get to that space station and back would have evolved out of the orbital x-15 and out of its ramjet scramjet program would have come a whole new generation of advanced propulsion systems which would have had a tremendous impact on history One hundred and ninety-nine flights were made in the X-15 program. For the space shuttle, and for whatever winged vehicles may follow, looking to fly across the threshold of space and back, its legacy is immense. <laughs>